Hi, everyone, and welcome to this panel. It's going to be really fun. Very excited to talk to all of you. My name is Deborah Isaac. I'm the founder of Houdini School and a longtime Houdini educator, currently at UCLA as well. Um, so first, what I would like to do is do a super brief intro of each of you. Uh, just talk about, like, talk, say your name and how you got to where you are today. Hi, my name is Greg Gangemi. I Hi. am head of 3D at FuseFX in New York. How I got here, it's a long story. Um, I've been doing CG since, I think, 2008 or so. Um, worked around in New York and LA um, and eventually landed at Fuse. And here I am. I've taught a f uh, several classes at SVA as well in Houdini. Nice. And can you pass the mic? Hey everyone, my name is David Estrich. I'm the global head of 3D for Zoic Studios. We have locations in Vancouver, LA, and New York. Today I got here by taking the A train. <laughs> now, I started out um, as an asset artist at a company called Look Effects that no longer exists. They were based out of Los Angeles. I worked from their New York office, stayed in New York market, worked as a generalist, and was lucky enough to get this position. Hey, hello everyone, I'm Ellie Zananiri. Uh, I am a uh, programmer, I guess I'd say, and I work in exhibit design mostly and uh, in XR uh, when it doesn't uh, annoy me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I got here, I, was, I basically always wanted to work in animation and I was really bad at it, so then I learned programming and now I always do programming that's related to graphics, so that's uh, what I do. Uh, I work at the Museum of Natural History and I also teach at NYU. Hey everyone, my name is Winslow Porter and I actually also work with this guy on a project that we presented yesterday about volumetric mushroom time-lapse. Um, before that, I also went to ITP and uh, started really getting into to VR and AR and first started doing it for agencies and then started my own studio called New Reality Company where we created a project called uh, Tree and uh, has since been doing some very zany metaverse consulting. Uh, but would love to also hear what you're, what you're all up to after this as well. Hi there, my name is Georges Hirovim. Um, I've been, oh wow, these are my students. <laughs> Thanks for all coming here. Um, so I got, uh, how did I get here? Uh, I started doing 3D and CG in general back in 99, uh, and then I went to university. I studied in Bournemouth um, in England, um, and then I got a job in London, working for film, and a little bit commercials, then in Vancouver, now in New York with Framestore, but now in the past few years I'm a freelancer, mm -hmm. and, uh, which is great because I can try all these different other studios, but also I'm trying to expand a little bit my um, scope of work, uh, working for like real-time stuff or experiential projections and other stuff, um, yeah, as well, so great. excited to be here. Thank you, mm -hmm. and it seems like all of you guys are both in industry and teaching, is that Kind of, correct? Yes, I yeah. actually also teach at Tesbias. Yeah. <laughs> so pretty much all these questions will be relevant to all of you, and I'll I'll ask you, and then if, chime in if someone is going to have an opinion, which I'm sure you will. Just just chime in when you want to say something. So I'll start I'll start with you, Greg. Um, <laughs> how are the needs of the industry changing? Is it still the standard pyro fluids destruction, or do you find that your Houdini needs are changing for who you recruit? Um, they are changing. Um, we have moved into a Houdini um, scene assembly and lighting environment. Uh, so we are using Houdini more widely. Uh, so we are looking for all of our artists to have Houdini skills, um, not, and particularly not, for, not always for pyro, fluids, et cetera. Um, we want people who are kind of general, generalist, you mm -hmm. know, who have a familiarity with the software. Um, we have a great team of Houdini effects artists, they're sitting over there. They do amazing simulations and all that stuff. But uh, for lighting and look dev and uh, scene assembly and layout, uh, we also need artists uh, with Houdini skills. So mm -hmm. that's changed significantly, I think, over the past, uh, you know, for us over the past six months. Mm. Nice. Um, what do you think about, I'll, and this is for you, um, how should students balance being a specialist versus a generalist? If you're really good at something and you want to specialize in that, then I would say put all your effort into that. If you find that you're spreading your skill sets and you're pretty decent, but you're not great at any one thing, more than likely you're going to be a great generalist. And 
I would say that goes a long way. There's a really critical need for generalists who can hop in and out of different pipeline tasks. But there's also that need for that one specialized person, like a senior person in that specific task. And so like, if you know that's what you want to do and you really show it, like you can excel in that, focus on that. If not, go the generalist route. You'll have a lot of opportunities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I see a lot of students when they're graduating, they just put everything in their reel, the, all the classes that they've taken in their, at their school. So should they, they should always be encouraged to only put their very best work and the, the work that um, they're, they excel the most at. Yeah, absolutely. They're, one of the biggest hindrances that I've seen is an artist just putting everything on there. Uh, if there is one weak piece in your reel, that detracts from all the great work that you've done. So even if you worked on it and you were proud of it, it's okay to have a one minute reel. It's okay to even have a 45 second reel. If you are adding stuff just for the sake of having it a minute, a minute, 30 seconds, don't do that. Leave it off. Mm -hmm. And that'll go a lot longer way to helping you land a job. Nice, thank you. Can I add to that? I think in the ideal case scenario, uh, you want to be a good generalist with a very strong, uh, with a very strong aspect. So with a specialization, so basically a little bit of both worlds. And what I mean by that, like I think having a specialization is it's a great thing because you can leverage it and go really far. Mm -hmm. But then I think it's also important to have a good understanding of all the other departments and all the other processes, mm -hmm. because in production, you always work within a team. And it's important to like know how to communicate and what the, you know, if you're an effects artist, you kind of need to know what the lighter is expecting from you. And ideally, you want to be able to like try out the assets before you pass them on to make sure that He's not going to come back to you angry that something is not working or anything. So I, I, I think it's very important to at least understand the language of all the other departments. Mm. And uh, yeah. I think it, there's also a big difference between doing it to try to get a job or a specific job or to try to also promote your own work, mm -hmm. you know, for say your own brand, you know, whether it comes to being hired to do something that is not just a specialization of, of a technical skill set, but yeah. a certain aesthetic one of your look. So I think that there's no shame in also creating multiple reels for yeah. different reasons. Um, and it really depends, you know, just like you do a job application differently, you know, being able to pull different aspects, but, you know, also making sure that if it's for yourself, then making, you know, making sure that it, it's mostly about the work that you're, that you're proud of doing and what separates you from other artists in the field. But just the term artist can also get confusing in the space because <laughs> technical artists oftentimes aren't actually, they, they have less artistic leeway than somebody who would be, you know, doing their own work for commissions. Right. Yeah, it's almost like working backwards, figuring out your goal first, and then what is the real that's going to support that goal? Um, and what do you think are the important traits as a junior effects artist? Um, uh, yeah, go ahead. Ellie? Yeah. yeah. Ellie. Um, I think uh, like uh, it's important to know what you know and to know what you don't know. And then to mm. it's totally fine to say, I don't know. I think that's the thing that uh, the a lot of the times with juniors, they're afraid to say that. They're, yeah. And they think that it's a, a problem that they don't know something. But you, I think people expect you not to know everything. And uh, the thing that it's like I think is the most frustrating was when somebody doesn't know something and they mm. don't tell you and then they try to do it in a way that's not correct and there's just a lot of time that's wasted and you're like I, I mean I, you feel bad but you're also like you know this, there's like a lot of like drama that's happening that shouldn't happen like it's totally fine not to know everything um, so yeah I think just know know what you know <laughs> I think that's great advice you know being able to ask questions um, and not being afraid and, and even not as a junior, I think, uh, you know, as uh, someone yeah. who's been doing this for like over a decade now, like I, there's stuff I don't know and it's, it's totally fine. Like it's, you shouldn't feel bad about it. How do you think balancing, you know, the aspects of what you guys are looking for in a junior effects artist, let's say if you were hiring, um, technical versus their like personality and uh, can do attitude and artistic eye. I'd say those are the three big ones. How do you, do you think one is more important than the other two? Or do so you have something to say about that? Sure. Um, <clears throat> you asked about technical skill, artistic eye, and can do attitude. Correct. I think those three are like, to me, are <laughs> on an equal level, I would say. Um, the attitude of a junior artist is incredibly important. Um, 
being willing to a you know ask questions when you need to when you don't understand something um but then being willing to to try whatever to jump in there and just you know get your hands dirty uh, making your best effort um having a good eye is critical because you can understand more quickly and easily what's going right or wrong with your own work uh, and this is a problem not just with junior artists but at all levels um, people sometimes have a hard time identifying what might be wrong with their work yeah. and that's crucial um, technical skills also very important um, being able to understand at least the fundamentals um, and that's not just software that's you know physics to some level uh, principles of um, you know light and shadow artistic composition mm -hmm. those kinds of things are, are really important as well um, so I think uh, those things are all equally important so it's interesting asking questions when you don't know something technically, but maybe also asking, how does this look if your eye, if you, if you feel like your eye is not quite trained enough? Absolutely, yeah. yes. And taking time to understand when you get a note to understand really what the note is about. It's not just fixing this one thing, mm -hmm. but it's about understanding how next time you can maybe um, give that note to yourself before right. you have to hand it off to someone else to give you the note so you can um, just be more critical of your own work and understand how it could be better. Yeah, and being able to take feedback on all of these three domains, yes, I think, is good. For sure, yeah. yes. And also, just to add to that, the can-do attitude is huge, but the can being able to figure out how to do it <laughs> attitude. Like, knowing that we can give a task and not have to, to for lack of a better word, babysit. Yeah. And know that the amount of time that we're, that we're hiring somebody is going to pay off in the long run, that... We can give tasks that they can learn how to do it, almost teach us some, some things as well, or many times teach us things that are just coming out, experimental features, but not having to, in the back of our mind, worry that what the tasks we're given could either you know, work out extremely well or you know, take another three days. Mm -hmm. So the <laughs> ability to, to, to be solve. yeah like autodidactic in, in many different ways and also be a team player. And again, the communication of that, like I was able to get this this much far. I think it'll take reasonably this many days for me to do it. But like being super open to that um, and also not you know being afraid to, to bring other people in to, to help answer something that could be incredibly esoteric that could somebody on the team might be able to to answer that in a matter of minutes. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I think it's important to note that too for a junior specifically that some of the technical abilities don't just come from the start. That's learned, right? So having it from the start is great, but you're always going to learn more as time goes on. But the personality goes a long way. If you're not able to work within a team dynamic and be calm and collective, especially under high pressure mm. delivery times, you're going to struggle. But having an artistic eye, I would say for a junior, the personality and artistic eye, if you have the technical side, but your work doesn't look good, mm -hmm. It doesn't matter how much technical knowledge you have. <laughs> and so I think it's more like as time goes on, you will continue to gain the technical knowledge. So yeah. even if you don't have it from the start, don't let that be a barrier to doing what you want to do. Right. So this is also great. Yeah, I just want to add the last thing. Like, I, I completely agree with everything that has been said uh, so far. Uh, te technicalities is very important. Like, one thing that I it will always stand out to me when I see um, uh, a junior coming to the studio or like seeing a, a reel, I will, I'm always looking for like personal projects because mm. that to, to me that shows a very um, a clear indication that this person is the candidate is very uh, self-driven, which is very important. Like if, even if the, the course you're doing is like, you know, a decade long, uh, you're not going to learn everything from the university. Mm -hmm. Most of the knowledge we gain over the years is, is sort of like mostly like self-taught through experimentation, through trial and, uh, trial and error. So if, if I see a personal project or two or more, that indicates that there is a self-motivation, and which is like the most important, because like if, even at work, you, you're more, you should be asking questions, but if you ask the same question more than like three times, you're probably going to get annoying uh, and... and <laughs> yeah. So, There's a you, you, you you have to find basically you have to learn how to solve the problems on your own because yeah throughout my career I, I've always been solving problems like right. things break things don't work and it's a technical struggle yeah problem solving is a, a big deal mm -hmm. um, and speaking of balance um, what do you what are your views on work life balance I know this is a <laughs> Not, you know, a popular question, but um, there's so much burnout. Our industry is so brutal. Um, what are your thoughts on how to manage that? And have you 
guys successfully done it. <laughs> Think twice before you uh, do. <laughs> Uh, no, no it's, that's it, not the right answer. It, it's, it's, it's hard. Uh, it, it's hard because uh, it, it's also like a job that uh, involves sitting in front of the computer, which is not very healthy, but uh, I've been doing it for a while and uh, yeah. Uh, you don't have... <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think it's important to um, take breaks, regular bre breaks, yeah. which are outside, away from the monitor, not the break on the phone. Um, but this is just a reality. Yeah. Uh, you have thoughts on this. <laughs> and, and I agree. I think it's inevitable. Like, if you're going to have projects where, like, you, you're going to have crunch or you, yeah. they're going to take too long. You're going to have problems that are, are unexpected that you're going to have to deal with. Um, and you, I think the, you have to come in with the attitude that you're not going to do that, that you're going to take breaks, that you're going to have, like, a, a good balance. But when it does happen, um, don't, you just have to kind of deal with it. Uh, but as Georgia said, taking breaks helps a lot, especially when you're with unexpected problems. Like I find that banging my head against the keyboard for two hours doesn't help. But going out <laughs> and walking the dog and coming back, then oh, right away you'll you you just with a fresh pair of eyes, it solves a lot of problems. Yeah, breaks. And also, or sorry, I think there's also a difference between going into a place of work or working for somebody else, putting in, say, nine to five or ten to six and be able to come home and be done. Sometimes there also could be crunch. You could be working late hours. But if you form your own shop or work on your own projects, there's definitely the freedom there. But there's also the freedom for that to take over like your waking and sleeping hours too, because it's hard to sort of delineate time yeah. when the projects are your own, mm -hmm. because you're sort of your own boss and you're making up your own schedule. And sometimes you, you crunch yourself pretty hard too. So be very careful of that when working on projects for yourself or a team with friends. Um, where there isn't necessarily a clear sort of yeah, delineation of responsibilities and timelines. Did you have something to add? I do have something. Okay. <laughs> I would say in, in this remote workspace, mm. it's very difficult to manage work-life balance when you are home <laughs> and you're accessible all the time. And companies do know that. And so I think it's important to set expectations. Right. If you are working crunch mode, the majority of time crunch mode is due to a failure on a production level somewhere. Mm. The unfortunate fact is that that means the brunt of it is falling onto you and the artists and the teams doing the work. If you are setting realistic, realistic expectations, letting people know I'm not available on weekends, I'm not available after a certain point of time, they know ahead of time that they cannot ask you because you're not available. There are studios who are cognizant of that. They try to plan ahead. They ask you, are you available to work overtime? If they are not asking you and they are expecting that of you, find a different studio. Mm. And the only way this will change in the industry is if people start to assert that this is not acceptable. Crunch time is not something that is a, it's part of our industry, but it doesn't have to be part of our industry. And so the only way it can change, and it has been changing in certain mm. studios, is that you, you have to set these expectations. So boundaries and breaks are what I'm getting from that. Yeah. I'd like to respond. Um, so I think work-life balance is really uh, critical uh, in our industry. I know it's been uh, overlooked for, you know, most of the time I've been in, in the business. But um, I think it's an issue that is really, uh, un, you know, has to be grappled with by the management. The people who are managing the shows and the jobs they're responsible for setting the schedules and setting the expectations for artist time. I think in this age when artists have possibly more freedom to move between different studios, it's the burden is on the studio to make the work-life balance uh, healthy for the artists. Artist retention, you know, mm. I run a department, I have to hire uh, the artists. Retaining artists and making sure they're happy is uh, one of the most important parts of my job. I don't want to burn out my artists, and I don't want people to feel miserable at work. Um, I try to um, approach that, you know, at the kind of management level where uh, I do have to push back sometimes on bid, bid times, and schedules. And um, but I do think it's really important, and I do think artists can um, kind of reward studios that do uh, respect their work-life balance and kind of somehow punish them a little bit by not working for mm. studios that continually uh, ask you to work far in excess of what you've agreed to work, you know, I think. Uh, and that's not just so um, you can go 
I mean, it really is actually so you can go enjoy your life and you can learn about other stuff. I mean, yeah. I think really talented uh, artists in any commercial or fine art context, um, learning outside of work is critical to, to how you'll develop. So looking at films, looking at art or reading or whatever, or going outside, these are all valuable things. They're not <laughs> incidental. They're cr crucial, I think, to uh, the development of a good artist. Just to add a little bit uh, on that, on sort of like trying to force the studios to like respect our time. Uh, I think we're in a very privileged position right now because especially Houdini and in general with the explosion of uh, digital media, Houdini is in highly demand right now. So we do have a leverage of saying no to jobs, especially if the studios are not treating us well, mm -hmm. uh, it's probably easier to uh, say no and find another job. If, if there you yeah, go. So. Um, there you go. So that's the power here. Yep. <laughs> um, this is an education question. As an educator, how do you calm the fears of your students that are worried that Houdini is too hard and they're scared to learn it? <laughs> I think this resonates a little bit with the audience. Um, you know, and I get questions like, do I have to know how to code to use Houdini? And as much as Coding in Houdini is amazing. Um, you can use Houdini without it. It is not true that you have to code to use Houdini. So there's a there's a perception about Houdini um, that as a teacher, I think we all work on having to kind of dispel. So if anyone could talk to that, that'd be great. <laughs> um, that's a big topic. Uh, I think. Houdini, it's much easier for somebody who knows programming and maths to pick up in the beginning. That's the reality. Of course, you can use it without knowing any of that. But to my mind, if you're going to dive into Houdini, you may as well, in order to get the most out of it, you're going to get the most out of it if you know these basic principles. And you don't need to be a computer programmer, but as long as you know the, some fundamentals, I think you can uh, go much further. But isn't there a way to be inclusive for the artists and the technical artists? Because there's plenty of artists that they can, you know, dial things in after the tech artist makes the tool for them and have a lot of fun with it. Um, I'm just, you know, playing. Sure. Advocate yeah. I, but in, I, I, ideally, you want to have like both sides. I, I mean, I understand yeah. that's not the case. Uh, in, with all the candidates or in, with, with all the artists, but um, um, I, I, I do find it hard to like teach students who didn't without right. explaining first some of the fundamentals. Yes. Um, and, and many times I find myself taking a step back and sort of like saying, oh, before I explain this, let me give you a half an hour overview of, I don't know what a vector is, but right. in reality you need two months you know, yeah. trying, you know, so I'm trying to like brush it, kind of like go over some topics very quickly, um, kind of like to explain the basic concepts. But yeah, it's it's, it's hard. I I, I, find, I I do find. Yeah, it. and and then the flip side of that is why is it a big deal in the first place? People learn new languages, they learn instruments, and it's hard to learn these things. So why should it be easy in that sense? Does that make sense? Yeah, and in a way, in today's uh, reality, like uh, we all use computers, no matter what we do. So I, I personally find programming sort of like the language of computers. So it's sort of like the literature of, of the future. Like, mm -hmm. uh, cool. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, in my mind, I think there is a, a real space for non-programming technical Houdini artists. You know, at Fuse we have. Um, we have a lighting, a lighting pipeline now in Houdini. So there is a lot of work to be done for uh, people with general Houdini skills. You don't have to be uh, doing all your work in wrangles and you know typing words all the time. You can use the nodes, you can use VOPs, you can use a lot of different things. Um, having a general familiarity, and this is kind of what I tried to teach in my Houdini class, was like demystifying the software a bit for um, artists who just want to get comfortable in the software. And I think that's an important first step if you say, you can't learn Houdini unless you know how to do computer programming. You're going to just turn off, you know, a lot of people. And <laughs> yeah. so, I mean, to me, I think there's room for for all types in Houdini. It's not just for extremely technical uh, programmers. It's for 
people who are artistic, who have an uh, artistic eye, and they just want to be creative. You know, it's a really creative software and can be used in an in, in infinite number of ways. So I don't think there's any limitation if you do it one way or the other. Um, but there's definitely a spot um, for artists with kind of non-technical Houdini you know, familiarity. I think uh, I just want to say one thing. I'm not a. I don't teach Houdini. I teach graphics programming. So it's. I'm coming in from the code side of things. But one thing I tell my students a lot is, uh, if you're motivated enough, like you'll, you just have to chip away at it, and eventually you'll kind of get it. And also, I think most students think they need to understand everything about mm. programming right off the bat. And if they don't understand something, it kind of freaks them out, and they they need to figure it out. But it'll eventually come if it needs to. And if you know, if you don't know what a cross product is, but you know you need to use it somewhere, then just just plug it in it'll be fine and eventually yeah, okay. at some point <laughs> you'll understand why it, why you need to have why it needs to happen but you don't need to understand everything off the bat this is all good thank yeah. you yeah the truth is too like most of you who would be wanting to start in houdini if you don't already use it why is it scary i have a feeling you're using another dcc mm. or another dcc these are all complicated yeah that's right it's no more complicated than houdini it's just different right and as an artist, you absolutely can jump in there, start to use SOPs. You don't need to use VEX. You can just start putting nodes together, learning how the software works. You will absolutely thrive in this environment because you might already have a concept of 3D. What is a polygon? What is a vertex? Like, You have these concepts. I think it's actually harder to start in Houdini from scratch. I found that even for myself, I came from a different environment and I was using a DCC that I no longer want to use. <laughs> but I, I said... I knew how to do 3D when I was in that software. Right. I didn't understand 3D until I started using Houdini. Mm -hmm. There you go. Well, that's a good quote. Um, so we're going to open it up to Q&A now. Uh, anyone have questions in the audience? Any questions? Really? Ah, I knew it. Awesome. OK, I'm going to hang on. I'm going to pass the microphone. If you guys could just assist me to pass it down the line to get to the person. Hi, um, so I'm um, coming from a, um, an animator, so I have no knowledge of like programming and stuff. So my question is, uh, is there um, a way to learn programming specifically for um, Houdini? And um, where do I like kind of start or do I just have to like, you know, go through the whole programming kind of, I guess, like pro pro like education or whatever i think this goes right to what we were just talking about um for an animator there's a lot to know and a lot to explore in houdini kin effects rigging mm -hmm. system um you know uh, the new ragdoll tools and all those there's there's a lot of cool tools in there you don't need to learn any programming to use those yeah yeah so i mean i'm just thinking like you know what if i do want to learn programming um for houdini you know yeah, I think one of the best resources, honestly, that introduces you to VEX, like if you're in Houdini, you're going to be using a combination of VEX and Python. And VEX, you know, you're using on geometry. And so that's most likely what the rabbit hole you're going to go down. CG Wiki is one of the best resources that anyone can look at. And you'll have very simple examples. And you can just spend a week going through everything, then two weeks going through everything. You will have examples presented to you in little GIFs or GIFs, yeah. depending how you want to pronounce it. And <laughs> you'll have a better understanding of how to write this stuff. And I think that's the best place to start, honestly, in my opinion. C CG Wiki? CG Wiki, yeah. And uh, The Joys of Vex, I think he wrote a book. Yes. Yeah, yeah, pretty great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions from the Oh, we got another one. Oh. Where are you going? Hi. Um, so because Houdini is such a powerful tool to learn, and also it can do like from pyro, uh, cloth simulation, grooming. So for a junior, um, do we need to learn like many aspects of it, or do we just find one or two or three? I don't know. Should we learn all of it? <laughs> I'd say again, it's like start with the goal and work backwards. Like, what are you most interested in pursuing versus maybe the needs of the environment, uh, the needs of the industry um, you might want to consider too. Is that your question? Yeah, I think that's a good, a valid question. And um, 
I know in the beginning it's overwhelming when you first open Houdini and you press tab and you see like 200 nodes that you don't know what they're doing and you look at the documentation and they're like pages and pages. I think the best is to, as you said, to like start from a goal. Set yourself a, a small manageable project. Don't look at Pixar. Don't look at like high-end productions. Just do something simply like a five-second shot and so like start with a specific project. So then you can break it down in like five, I don't know, three, four, five tasks. And then you say, okay, for the next two weeks, I'm going to learn these five things uh, at once. Because otherwise, it's very, it's very easy to like lose track. There are so many things out there. You can get so many rabbit holes, as we heard. And uh, it, it's very easy to lose track of what you're doing and the purpose of why you're doing it. So it, it's uh, like nowadays, after having switched between like a dozen different applications, uh, I deny to learn anything new unless if I have a very clear reason to do it. I'm not going to lear learn it just for the sake of learning it. I need, a, I need a goal, I need a target to know where I'm going to, so I know where my deadline is as well. That's really super important. Hmm. Great. Any other questions? Hey, so you're a student fresh out of school. Uh, you've been throwing your reel places. You're not getting many bites. You're um, you're kind of getting discouraged. What kind of resources, communities? What could you get involved with? What kind of mentors could you look out for? Like, what would your next steps be to continue on that journey to get to your your foot in the door and to thrive? Um, quickly, I would just say doing personal projects. Uh, that's the best way to continue to improve your skills and. You can find resources online. There's a million. Um, you know, you can first look at the side effects site for the tutorials, but give yourself a project you want to do. It, it should be small and manageable, um, but show some skills, some very uh, you know clear examples of certain skills, and uh, make a little you know short film, for example, you know a 30 second whatever, and uh, show your skills that way. There's certainly no nothing holding you back. You can. Always, even if you have a job, you should always be continuing to improve your own skills in your own time anyway. So I think just working all the time, um, just like if you're an animator, you should always be animating, trying to get your, your animation chops better. Um, so just keep working and uh, put it into a small personal project. And keep asking for feedback. Yeah, and just to add, like, I, I support this 100%. Uh, I would do the same, continue doing personal work. And I, I think what's important nowadays with the internet, the explosion of the internet, there is so much audience out there. And even though you may not get a job at your dream studio, um, nowadays we see all this digital content going online, on the social media, and people are getting job offers just through posting on social media. And I'm not even going to mention NFTs or... <laughs> also, um, you know, if there's a favorite musician um, or person who works in another field, you know, that's inspired you, you know, like, obviously credit them in the work, but, you know, celebrate their work as something that inspired you to help get it out to a, a broader audience. Uh, I would say, especially from a music perspective, you know, what's that 10, 20 second little piece of content that you can create that would inspire maybe that person to reach back out and be like, I really like that. Let's maybe riff on that again. Or somebody else also finding that connection with that with that artist. There's a lot of ability to, as Giorgio said, get recognized with just little bite-sized pieces of content that yeah. can get shared faster than you know anything that ever had existed before any other platforms. And then uh, one thing I wanted to add is you I, you get a lot of the jobs uh, that you get through contacts through people you know, which is just a reality of the thing. So. Uh, reach out to your student, like your fellow students that you went to school with, see what they're up to. Uh, join meetups. I know yesterday they were saying there's a Houdini meetup group in New York. Join that, see what people are up to there, and it helps a lot to just see what everybody else is up to, and uh, that's how you'll you'll just uh, expand your network. We work in a remote, you know, society today, so don't give up. You can keep posting on social media. You don't have to be limited to looking for work in New York or in LA. There are so many opportunities that you can work and be in New York, but you're working for a company in Texas, right? And so I think there's more opportunity than people realize because now the borders are completely open. If you're working in episodics and features, we still have a limitation around tax incentives. But if you're not working in any one of those fields, the doors are open. And social media, 
personal works, continue doing that. And honestly, like, be, don't be afraid to be proactive. Um, if you're a professional, you're getting hit up on LinkedIn all the time, cold calls for people trying to reach out to you for something. It's not gonna hurt you to reach out to individuals and say, hey, I found your information, I know you're a supervisor, I'd just like to get some feedback. You know, if they actually don't respond, you didn't lose anything. You didn't have that info to begin with. So don't be afraid to reach out and really advocate for yourself. Yeah, I was gonna say exactly that. Um, that soup, that you know, tech artist, whoever that was, was in almost exactly your same position at some point. And so I think the feedback part is kind of a nice way to be like, you know, look at my work. If you like it, you know, here's the opportunity for you to take it a step further. Uh, but you also will get, you know, brutal and honest feedback, which will also be helpful. But that person, sort of the more that they can relate to your story and, and the sort of vision that you have as an artist, the more that they're also going to remember you maybe down the line. Mm -hmm. At that moment, there might not be anything available, but maybe their friend has a new production that's happening. And, you know, actually, I do remember there was this person who reached out to me and then, you know, the ability for them to, to, to contact you. So keep that, keep communication pretty pretty common or constant with people that you'd like to work with and you never know it might it might pay off in the future yeah I'll just share like my own personal experience so I didn't have the opportunity to, to go to school for this uh, I knew I wanted to do this for a career but it just wasn't feasible at the time to transition away from my existing degree and spend more money I spent every hour I could doing personal works so it wasn't good enough okay I'm gonna keep bettering myself I spent the better part of about a year and a half reaching out to every studio I could, trying to get my foot in the door just to show them a reel. And most companies wouldn't even look at it because I didn't come from an art background until one company, which was Look Effects that I mentioned earlier, mm. brought me in and that was my entry point. But it was a year and a half probably of like really struggling that I almost gave up on this because I was like, I can't keep doing this, I'm not getting anywhere. But you have to persevere, you have to push through and take those chances. You have nothing to lose. What a wonderful note to end on. Um, thank you so much, all of you, for being here. Um, and yeah, let's have a round of applause for our panelists. Thanks for having us. <laughs>